Hi everybody. Before we start this episode, a quick note to say we record our episodes quite a way in advance. Uh, This one was made back in March of 2021 when we were still under lockdowns. There's a few references to not being allowed out and looking forward to visiting things in the future. Uh, Fortunately, we are allowed out again back now as of the time of releasing this episode and hopefully still will be by the time you come to listen to it. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who has listened to our first two episodes so far, and especially to everyone who has left really lovely comments on our social media on Instagram and Twitter. It's really great to hear that you're all enjoying listening so much. Hello, and welcome to Round or Round We Go. I'm Emily. I use she, they pronouns. Hi there, I'm Paul. I use he, him pronouns. And today we are looking at Hammersmith Station, but the Hammersmith Station that is on the Circle Line and the Hammersmith and City Line, which is a lot to say. So we're hopefully, you just need to remember that and then we'll we'll just talk about Hammersmith. We don't want to have to say Hammersmith, Hammersmith and City and Circle Lines every time we mention the name of the station. All right, so when we first drew this station, I was a bit, I wasn't that into it, I have to say. Um, I think the first two stations we had are stations I had either been to recently or knew somewhat. Um, I think it feels like such a dead-end kind of station. I mean, I think I went to the station once about a decade ago because I, at the time, lived in Neesden, so it made sense because I was going to Hammersmith that way. But any other time, I'd take the Piccadilly or the District Line. And it just feels like the only people who would take the train from there are people who live there and are working maybe sort of Baker Street ends of things. I don't know about your favorite. Yeah, I've never, ever had to travel from hammersmith station on the hammersmith and city line for any actual proper journey purposes the only reason i've ever been there which is once in my life is just after the new signaling system came into operation which we'll talk about later because hammersmith is on the first part of the underground's subsurface lines that hammersmith city circle district and metropolitan to be given their new four lines modernization signaling system back in 2019 and i was working on that project at the time and i thought oh that's brilliant i will uh get off a train that I was on the Piccadilly line heading back into town from Acton and thought I'll get off and have a special ride on the train from Hammersmith station just to experience what the trains were like with the new signalling. That's the only reason do, I've ever needed Paul, to go just, do, do you feel any different in a train that's having an old signalling system and a new signalling system? Honestly, I couldn't tell the difference. (laughs) I wouldn't think there'd be difference other than there'd be less problems with new signalling. And you can see real time. Trains are automatically controlled on the new signalling systems. It's no longer the driver in the cab, you know, using the throttle and the brake to drive the train. It's fully automatically controlled by the signalling. So it might have been possible to tell a difference, but I couldn't perceive it. Yeah, I mean, presumably the drivers previously were very well trained. They could do that very well. You could tell, actually, on the um, Jubilee line when that converted to automatic train control, because suddenly the train started kind of speeding up to full speed and then putting the brakes on and then speeding up. And it was a bit jerky compared with before. The human drivers were actually a bit better. Yes, you heard it here first. Humans being better than machines. Um, Okay, I think we're going to do the regular rundown for station facts. This one's a big one, so go for it. Okay, Hammersmith Station on the Circle and Hammersmith and City Lines is on the Circle and Hammersmith and City Lines. The station originally opened on the 13th of June 1864, a little far north of where it is now, with the station being reconstructed and reopened on its current site on the 1st of December of 1868. Hammersmith is in Zone 2, for fair purposes, and it is in the London borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. In 2019... Hammersmith served 10.25 million passengers. The station has full level access from entrance to trains. The current station building was designed by Percy Emerson Culverhouse. The origin of the name Hammersmith probably literally comes from Hammer and Smith, referring to a blacksmith. There is also a slight possibility that it may be from the old English word ham meaning town and hive meaning port, Uh, referring to the docks on the Thames nearby and 
Hamhide somehow changing into Hammersmith over the years, but that seems considerably less likely. Uh, we do know that the name Hammersmith was first recorded as being in existence in 1294. Hammersmith is served by almost 1,294 buses. Um, Deep breath, Bob, before you go into these ones. <laughs> the buses at Hammersmith are numbers 9, 23, 27, 72, 110, 190, 211, 218, 220, 267, 283, 295, 306, 533, H91, N9, N11, N27, N33, N72, N95, N97, and N266. You could be the new shipping forecast. People could go to sleep to your list of buses. All right, got to cover my ears for the labyrinth. (laughs) Yeah, because now comes the labyrinth, and this is a station Emily hasn't yet found the labyrinth at, so I will say it very, very quietly. The labyrinth is number 248 out of 270. It is located in the ticket hall next to the ticket machines. There we go. You can take your hands off your ears now. I realise that if I move my tongue around in my mouth, that's the only sound I can hear with my ears covered. It works. Well, there we go. I didn't hear anything. I think let's start off by talking about the history of the station and how it came to be there and, well, the kind of rebuildings of it that have happened. Mm -hmm. Um, And it all kind of starts off with the Hammersmith and City line being built by an independent company called the Hammersmith and City Railway, which was originally founded back in 1861. And they constructed their new line to branch off actually from the Great Western Railway up at uh, around where Westbourne Park Station is. So, it, so just for clarification, so the the Great Western Railway went into Paddington, yeah. but it branched off from there. The Hammersmith and City Railway branched off from there down to Hammersmith. Yes, that's how I'm picturing it. Yeah. yeah. So then it ran kind of south westwards towards Hammersmith Station, which is kind of close to the river. And then it was actually the original station was a bit further north of the Hammersmith Station that we know today, and it was originally on a site uh, that's kind of where the junction of Hammersmith Grove and Glenthorne Road is today. So the the buffers of the original station, where the trains come to a stop, would have been approximately where the kind of north end of Hammersmith Station is now. So yeah, so if you were at the very far. north end of the Hammersmith platform, that would be sort of where the old station had been. But yeah. there is no evidence of it there. No, really, it, there? W- it was completely demolished a few years later. So when the Hammersmith and City line was or sorry the Hammersmith and City Railway was built I always call things by their modern names when I I should I should lose that habit there were some notes in the observer about it uh the the observer described the station itself the first station as of simple and inexpensive construction but contains all the requisite accommodation for a suburb for for a suburban traffic a suburban traffic? A suburban traffic. I mean, papers didn't edit themselves very well back then. Um, but we found that actual Observer article on ProQuest, and there's even more details about the station, so I will read that. Paul, I feel like I should do some kind of special voice, but you can only do the Queen's voice, and I can't do any voices, so we're just doing my voice. The works throughout are plain in design, but seem to be constructed in a substantial manner, and we are pleased to observe that in crossing some of the larger thoroughfares, such as the Uxbridge and New Road, the girder bridges are of a more sightly appearance than what we have seen on some of the other lines lately built in the neighborhood of the metropolis. So clearly they had better bridges and the observer had strong feelings about the bridges that had been built lately. Yes, indeed. They uh, they were not happy with the other ones. They did also comment on the uh, trains that ran. Uh, they started at seven o'clock every morning, running from Hammersmith to Farringdon until 10 o'clock in the evening. First class fare would have cost eight pence, which would have been a fair deal of money in the day. Mm. Um, And it took you about 38 minutes to get from Hammersmith to Farringdon, compared with roughly 34 minutes now. So... Not that much of an improvement we've <laughs> we seen have, over We the haven't years. improved much on that line. It's not, it's, this is why you take the Piccadilly line instead if you're going anywhere sort of northeast. Um, but the second station. Yes. So I mentioned that the first station was completely demolished and that took place uh, because another station was being built at Hammersmith. And this was going to be on a branch of the London and South Western Railway. 
which mostly ran the mainline trains out of Waterloo. And they were building a new line which would enable them to run trains from Waterloo to Richmond via Hammersmith. And they wanted to build their station pretty much exactly where the original Hammersmith station was on the Hammersmith and City line. So they built their new Grove Road station, as it would be called, Hammersmith Station on Hammersmith and City, shifted southwards a bit to the site that it's on today. And that new station opened on the 1st of December of 1868. I love this period because it's just like, no, we're going to build a station here. No, we're going to build a station here. No, you're you're not going to have it. Like, it's just like work together. It was the Wild West. They were constantly building railways, not because the companies even wanted to run them particularly. They just wanted to stop one of the other companies from building a railway there. It just... And I, the fact that Parliament was just like, yeah, sure, we'll pass this, we'll pass this. I mean, they just would let anything happen. It's it's wild. I mean, very little of the population could vote. It was just wealthy men, so I guess there was that too. And the wealthy men all were investors in the railways, <laughs> yeah. so it was all there about it's, it's just It's just so funny to me, because I just think, surely you could have one station that interchanges things, but we didn't get to that for about 40, That would be 50. impeding the free market, Emily. We couldn't oh, have God. that. Oh, God. <laughs> all right, so we got our second station, which was a wooden building, with we don't know much about it. No, it there don't prob- seem to be any photographs of it, any drawings of it in particular. It was it's probably a pretty nondescript wooden building. But it was connected up with a footbridge to this Grove Road station just to the north. So um, I just want to stop, clarify this, because sometimes it's a bit hard for me to understand it here. So you had the first station. Yep. Just south of it was the new station, but they yep. got rid of the first station. Yep. They just got rid of the first station because the other because Grove Road was being built. Yeah, because it was in the way of where they needed to build Grove Road Station. Okay, fair enough. So you had the first station to the north. To the south, you have what is where today's station yep. is. Yeah, and then it's just west of that that Grove Road is. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah just okay. to the west. Cool. And that station, it was only open uh, from first of January eighteen sixty nine up until the fifth of June nineteen sixteen. So it wasn't a particularly long lived station at Grove Road. Um, it was a very busy station originally, uh, lots of passengers using it. But then when later on the Hammersmith and City line was electrified and when electric trams came along, there was lots of competition. They lost all their passengers. They closed the station down. But in fact, there's still a few remnants of the viaducts that the tracks ran on. You can see from the Piccadilly and the district lines kind of just west of Hammersmith. And the station itself, the building, was actually in use as a banana store up until about 1954. Um, and was then demolished a while after. I think there's a big office block on the site there. I quite like that they just were like, oh, let's sell some bananas here. That's it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just, it, um, I would make an Arrested Development joke, but you've never seen Arrested Development, but I'm sure people who are Arrested Development fans are making that joke. Now, today's station is in the same location as that second station, so the same location as the southern Hammersmith station, not the same location as Hammersmith Grove Road, but that is a different station than that original second station. Yeah, the original wooden building on the current site didn't last very long at all. By 1902, it was reported to be in very poor condition with rotting timbers and the roof near to collapse, which sounds quite an urgent situation. (laughs) Uh, So five years later, they finally got round to awarding a tender for the reconstruction of the station um, in September of 1907. Uh, It cost £12,039 to rebuild. Very Um, specific. Very specific. (laughs) Exactly, £39 on the end there. And the station was then rebuilt between 1907 and 1909. It was really quite a grand brick building with a large concourse and um, roofs over the platforms. And that's the station building that we see today, with a few changes over the years. In 1911, they added, uh, sorry, 1912, they added semicircular booking office on the station concourse, which I think was really quite beautiful. Uh, The photographs of it show that it would have had kind of green tiling, mosaic style all around it. But I still like the, the features that remain today, those black and white tiles on the floor and things yeah. like that. They're really beautiful. One little neat bit in the history of the station is that there was a barber, Alexander's Barbers. I don't know if that's what it was called when it first opened, but in 1911, the barbers opened in the station itself, right in the front of the station. They were told that they had to leave in 2013 because of redevelopment work and there was a big outcry they, they had a lot of loyal fans uh footballers people from tv lots of people went to this barber shop and they wound up 
finding that one of the money lending shops just next door to the station closed. So now they are no longer in the station. There is a Pret in the station instead. At least there was. I know a lot of Prets have closed. But right next door to the station is the barber shop. You should go get your hair cut there. When shop, yeah, when perfect place are... for a post-lockdown haircut. Yeah, if, well, if you can travel on. Or cycle all the way there. Indeed. Get your hair cut. And then check out the station without going in if you're not allowed to go in. That's, that's, that's how we should do it. Now, when we started to look at the pictures of the station, because as I said, I haven't probably been to the station for a decade, at least. I can't remember being to the station. I thought, oh, wow, it kind of reminds me of Paddington, which is a station that I don't go to frequently, but at least more frequently than this. And turns out there's very good reason for that. That's because it was actually designed by the architect of the Great Western Railway at the time, Percy Emerson Culverhouse. Because the station was partly owned by the Great Western Railway. And this dates back to how the whole Hammersmith and City Railway came to be built back in the 1860s. Which I think is really quite fascinating. Because one of the weird things about the Hammersmith and City line, which you pointed out, yeah. is that it doesn't go to the city. Yeah, exactly. I think You're like, Hammersmith and City, that doesn't go to the city of London. I mean, you can broadly... It goes to the city of Westminster's edges, I guess. But definitely at the time, anything that says Anne City is essentially going to Bank or, or somewhere near it, Liverpool Street, somewhere in the proper city of London. But in fact, the Hammersmith and City Railway, it was constructed... As an independent company, which didn't intend to run its own trains at all, it connected up to the Great Western Railway on its sort of way into Paddington. And the plan was that either the Great Western Railway or the Metropolitan Railway would be able to run their trains starting from Hammersmith Station and then kind of join up at Paddington onto the Metropolitan Railway and run along through their stations all the way till you reached the city in Farringdon, which was the terminus of the Metropolitan at the time. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting thing to, to sort of understand, because I think if you, like me, maybe don't know quite as much about the tube, or at least its history and depth, I think that idea that actually the Metropolitan Railway, that you think, oh, this is the first underground in the world, this is such an incredible thing, and I think of it as, okay, this is this line that just the Metropolitan Railway ran, the only people running trains on there is the Metropolitan Railway, but actually that line was used by a lot of other train companies to bring trains into the city. Yeah, and then the really complicated thing about that was that there were multiple different gauges being used by railways running at the time. Now, the gauge for anyone not familiar with it, is the distance between the rails that the train's wheels run on. So most railways in the United Kingdom and a fairly large chunk of the rest of the world, mainland Europe largely, the United States, etc., they run with rails that are four foot eight and a half inches apart, which was a gauge set by uh, George Stevenson based on what had been used by horse-drawn wagons running many, many centuries into the past. And that was the gauge that was used by most of the railways in the UK at the time that the Metropolitan Line was built. But there was one outlier, which was the Great Western Railway. Because someone just can't get with the programme. Well, indeed. Else. And the person in question was Brunel, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, another famous engineer. Yeah. He thought he would do things a bit differently and built the Great Western Railway with a track gauge of seven feet and a quarter of an inch. Um, and... He thought that would actually be much better. You could run bigger trains, you could run faster trains. It worked fairly well, except for the problem that A, it was more expensive to build, and B, it meant that you couldn't run trains on both gauges of track because the wheels needed to be different spaces apart. So it caused a lot of complexities. And one of the solutions to that complexity was sometimes you would build dual gauge railways, which is where you'd have three rails so that trains could have the wheels either four foot eight and a half inches apart, or they could be the seven foot and a bit apart if they were running on the other rails. So it made everything rather more complicated. And the Hammersmith and City Railway, because it was running off the Great Western Railway, uh, was built with this dual gauge. So there'd have been extra rails. You could run either broad gauge or standard gauge trains along the tracks all the way into Hammersmith when it first opened. I really wish anyone listening could see this because you are really like, I'm getting exact measurements with your hands. I'm not sure they're actually exact, <laughs> but he is really, he is really showing exactly how wide these, these gauges are. I think if you want to see a little bit more of that, I would recommend looking it up and seeing how that worked with dual gauge rails and things like that. So it is a complicated situation, but they somehow made it work. 
Well, they sort of made it work. Because, in fact, when the railway first opened, it was the Great Western Railway that ran all of the trains from Hammersmith all the way over to Farringdon. Farringdon um, Road. Wasn't Farringdon it? Street. Oh, Farringdon Street. Mm, Sorry, Farringdon yes. Street. That is not that is close, but not the same place where Farringdon is today, the original terminus of the Metropolitan Line, Farringdon Street. However, the Metropolitan Railway wasn't entirely impressed by how the Great Western was running their trains. Um, they thought they were rather unsafe. Um, on the 8th of July, 1864, a Great Western Railway carriage without any brakes smashed through the buffer stop at Hammersmith. Um, only two <laughs> days just, later... How did they have a train with no brakes? I think they were shunting the carriages around. Okay. Um, and a lot of the carriages back then, they wouldn't have had... Independent um, brakes. Yeah, independent just brakes. Just the local, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, they were shunting it round. It got free. It smashed through the buffers. Only two days later, they managed to shunt a carriage off the line using the junction at Hammersmith. So the Metropolitan Railway said, no, you're not running out. You're not running the trains on this line anymore. Um, and they took over the operations of the Hammersmith and City Railway from the 1st of April of 1865. Um, so it's now run by the Met, but is the station still... The station is operated by the Hammersmith and City Railway or by the GWR, the station itself? So the railway passed on the 1st of June 1866 to be formally controlled by the Metropolitan and the Great Western, yeah. uh, rather than the Hammersmith and City continuing to exist as an independent company. And so it no longer existed, yeah. the company itself, yeah. Yeah, it was run by a joint committee of the other two railways. And that kind of continued to be the case for a really long time, actually. It was run jointly by the Metropolitan and the Great Western right up until... First of all, in 1933, when London Transport was formed, and that took over the Metropolitan Railway. So then it was run jointly by the Great Western and the uh, London Transport. And then that continued until 1948, when the Great Western Railway got nationalised into British Railways. And then it became wholly owned by London Transport, as it is today. Um, well, Transport for London today. Um, but while it was owned between the Metropolitan Railway and the GWR, there was some good drama going on because there is always good drama mm -hmm. on railways. Like, as we said, we could make a podcast just about the drama, a Netflix series, really, about the drama between these railway companies. Oh, yes. There there was some real shenanigans going on. But I think... So, but real time... shenanigans, Paul. How are you 90? <laughs> Who says real shenanigans? Okay, you can continue. I it's mean, fine. how do you describe using steam locomotives to block each other's trains into stations? I don't That's know. That's shenanigans. Uh, pranks, maybe, if we use, like, <laughs> modern lingo? It's hardly a prank, though. Okay, okay, fine. Anyway, nothing quite that dramatic at Hammersmith, but on the Hammersmith and City Line trains, once they electrified the trains and started using sort of slightly more modern electric trains rather than steam trains in 1906, they had to reach an agreement that one side of each train would say Great Western and Metropolitan Railways, and then painted on the other side of the train, it would say Metropolitan and Great Western Railways. Because they couldn't... Because they're decide. so petty. Yes, it's exactly. so petty. Oh, there was just no cooperation between any of these companies at the time. I mean, you still get things like that on railways in this country, outside London and inside London, but it is still incredibly petty. So we're at the point where Transport for London, or what London Transport at the time, takes over. Anything else we've got in terms of this well, bit of history in the line? One of the intriguing facets of it being originally kind of part of a mainline company is that there would have been freight trains. And there was a, a goods yard right next to Hammersmith Station, which had coal trains coming into it, which were run by the Great Western Railway. They would originally have been sort of broad gauge steam hauled trains. After the Great Western stopped running the passenger trains, they got rid of the broad gauge track, so it was just standard gauge, because that's what the Metropolitan was using by then. But the goods yard remained operational with coal trains coming through it right up until 1960, which is really not something we'd expect at all, I think, on a sort of modern London underground yeah. line today. I mean, it's wild to me, even when I'm on uh, the overground, because I'm often taking the overground, and I see a freight train coming through, but to actually see one on an underground station would just be wild i can't yeah. i can't imagine that actually that went on that long which is interesting and the other interesting thing about it being kind of a mainline station is that you could buy through tickets from hammersmith first of all from about 1878 to anywhere that the great western railway ran so you could buy a ticket all the way to uh, guernsey 
via a steamer from Weymouth travelling on the Great Western Railway. And that carried on being the case right up until about the 1960s that you could buy mainline tickets uh, from Hammersmith Station. Yeah, so actually it's, it's just so much more interesting than I expected to be, sort of the dead end of a sort of dead line that you wouldn't use unless you lived over there, to actually there's such a rich history to it. And if we go to the actual idea from this line that was mostly operated as part of the Met for most of its more recent history until you get to 1990 when it assumes a new identity and a new line as the Hammersmith and City line. Yeah, I mean once London Transport had taken over in 1933 they ran it as part of the London Underground Metropolitan Line, a sort of dark purple colour like we expect for the Metropolitan yeah, Line. Yeah, it's all, all um, the same identity on the two maps. And that continued to be the case right up until 1990. And in the aftermath of the fire at King's Cross Station in 1987, which had been really quite disastrous, there was a need for huge new safety measures to be taken on the London Underground. And part of that was they wanted there to be a more accountable management structure so people could actually come in and enforce this new safety culture on the London Underground. And new line management um, units were created, one of which would be the Hammersmith and City and Circle line, broken away from the old Metropolitan line management. And as part of that, in 1990, they decided that the Hammersmith and City would now, for the first time, have its own identity as a line on the tube map, and mm-hmm. it would be coloured pink, as we know it today, and the trains would be called Hammersmith and City line trains. Yeah, and I think it's, the interesting point for that is that while it was operated from a management perspective with the Circle Line, it wasn't entirely redundant with the Circle Line as it is today. It was mostly covering the top part of the Circle Line, but it wasn't until 2009 that the Circle Line uncircled and had that offshoot that goes to Hammersmith now. Originally, you had the Circle Line just going around in circles, and interesting, I mean, that created a lot of problems, which we'll probably get into on some of the Circle Line episodes. You Notably, you couldn't really take the trains off if there were delays and things. If a train broke, then you had you were stuck with delays. And interestingly, it, it was in a parliamentary bill that that Circle Line had to exist as it was, which is why it took so long for changes to actually happen. But in 2009, it was uncircled. So now you cannot ride the whole loop. You have to change at Edgware Road or you could change anywhere, really, and go the other direction. But if you want to ride the whole route, you have to change at Edgware Road, and now the Circle Line as well goes beyond its Circle Lane and goes all the way down to Hammersmith. So now you have both those lines arriving there. Yeah, and that uncircling of the Circle Line was all part of the modernisation of the Circle Line, the Hammersmith and City Line, the Metropolitan and the District Line, all of these subsurface lines which I mentioned back at the beginning of when we were talking about, and I mentioned the, the four lines modernisation, the re-signalling mm-hmm. uh, of these lines. And Hammersmith was the first sort of part of the lines to have the new signalling system put into action with the trains automatically controlled back on the 17th of March 2019, which is the only reason I've ever been to Hammersmith, to have a <laughs> ride on the now automatically controlled trains. I mean, it's interesting because I do remember uh, going to places like Ladbroke Grove and stuff on the line. I mean, again, it's not somewhere I've always lived. Well, I lived in northwest London for a while, but for the qu- quite a while I've lived in, in northeast London. And I think, yeah, it's not a place I'd go very often unless I had to go to Ladbroke Grove or sometimes there's a restaurant or something to go over there. And I remember just every time you were on the, I was on those platforms, I think, why, why can't you? There's no dot matrixes that tell me when the next train is coming it just feels kind of a bit it feels very outer it doesn't feel like you're in a central london yeah. station and that's quite a central location i mean hammersmith yeah granted it's it's a little to the west but it's not that far out from the center of london but yeah you feel that that area is a bit a bit abandoned really but i guess that's changed now i get i haven't been there that often but it has is changed yeah i think improved displays all the train times and destinations are all part of the modernisation. Um, and in fact, there's another link into this modernisation of the signalling uh, at Hammersmith, because just somewhere nearby to Hammersmith Station is the Hammersmith Signalling Control Centre, which is where all of the signalling on all of these lines, the four district circle metropolitan Hammersmith and City, will all be controlled from one huge signal box, basically. Um, and... It's somewhere near Hammersmith Station, and I'm not allowed to tell you where, because it's officially <laughs> of course, secret, it's a, it's and it's a high thing, security yeah. facility. Of course. So yeah, a lot a lot going on there in making that 
sort of a better, more usable service for the people who do use it. It is quite, I mean, I actually was on that bit of the line a couple of weeks ago because I had an appointment out in Wood, well, I went to Wood Lane. It wasn't quite the closest tube station, but I wanted to go to Wood Lane. And it does feel, it's a quiet bit of line, but it is valuable for the people yeah. out there and people who work out there and things like that. Of course, it could have become a bit busier if there had been the proposal for another station to be built there, which never quite happened. Oh, there were so many proposals out there. Okay, which which proposal are we going to look at now, Paul? Well, should we start off with the 1902 attempt to build another station there? Yeah, so basically what happened here is you've got the central line, right? And it terminates at Shepherd's Bush, which is not very far from what at the time was called Shepherd's Bush, but is now called Shepherd's Bush Market. It's it's just across a little green, essentially, to, from Shepherd's Bush Market, which is on the Hammersmith and City line, and Shepherd's Bush, which was on the central line of the Central London Railway. And what you had is... This proposal in 1901 from the Central London Railway that then became the Central Line to have these looped terminuses. So essentially, at, it terminated at Shepherd's Bush and terminated at Bank. And they wanted to create a little loop that meant it was easier for them to turn the trains yeah. around, essentially. That because was... the trains at the time, they had locomotives hauling the carriages. So every time you got to the buffer stops at one end, you'd have to uncouple the locomotive, run it round to the other end, couple it back on, head the other way. So, they... so if you have a loop, it's a lot easier. Yeah, so they wanted to do these little loops. But they thought that it wouldn't get through Parliament to put a loop right by Bank Station. It's too big, it's too busy, there's too many important buildings. So they thought, we've got a better idea than just having this loop. We're going to make a bigger proposal. And our proposal is going to be to make the loop at the bank end go to Liverpool Street and I think it was St. Mary's White Chapel around there. So they were going to make a little loop on that end. So they're like, oh, you can get more people. It can go to more stations so that maybe Parliament will approve it. And then... Th that tiny little loop would connect at Bank, and then there would be a giant loop the other direction that would go along what is the bit that is the central line right now, would reach out to Shepherd's Bush, would go down to Hammersmith, and then basically circle back along kind of where the district line is now. So it would be this massive loop, and they tried to get that through Parliament in 1902, um, but it was rejected for the same reason the original one was rejected, they didn't want them to be tunneling that much under bank. Although eventually they, of course, did go to Liverpool straight, but that wasn't for um, some years after that. So if that had gone ahead, the Hammersmith station would have ended up being on the central line all the way back in the early 1900s. And it wouldn't even have been the central line, as we know it. It would have been some sort of weird figure of eight line running underneath central <laughs> figure, London. It would be a figure of eight where the, the left half, like the west half of the eight is giant and the east half of the eight is about the size of a like ring for your finger. It's it's so, so disproportionate. Look up if you want to look up the map of that. It's quite it's quite a funny proposal that that, of course, never got made and they did try again for another proposal uh the central line well they were trying a lot to reach out to R richmond so they tried again in 1920 to propose something new but that just never happened um it was interesting that i was reading about uh that you could pay a reduced fare if you rode the entire length of the central railway which i quite like as an idea as a transport enthusiast and it would be you know if you worked at bank and live near shepherd's bush well that's a that's a discounted commute for you but i just thought that was quite funny when you think about today being like going through zone one costs you but i guess finding a weird route that avoids zone one like i normally do doesn't cost you money so you know you win some and you lose some Is that all we have on the station and its history and the line? I think other than its use for music a few videos. music videos. Yes, it's in music videos, which is very exciting. I feel like it's probably one of the ones that the, the filming team is kind of like, yeah, fine, film here. There's not that much happening here. It's used in two music videos, at least that we know of because the Wikipedia article told us this. It could be in other music videos. We don't do our research on Wikipedia. We have a giant stack of books, but um, I'm not sure there's a book that says all the music videos film places. So there was the first version of Lily Allen's LDN music video released in 2006. So not her regular version of the music video. You have to search for the first version. It's 
I think it's trying to make it look like it's an old film with a really low frame rate. It kind of makes me nauseous to watch. I mean, when I saw the film, I thought it looked like it was filmed by a bunch of sixth formers after school. (laughs) She's just basically riding around London on her bike, which she says she's doing in the song, so it works. Anyway, she goes into Hammersmith Station. There's also a song called uh, Bravo Lover by Jolin Tsai. I may be pronouncing that wrong. She is a Taiwanese pop star. And actually, if you search this song, it's this kind to the kind of universality of mass-produced pop it looks you know she's singing in she's not singing in english well she has a few words in english in there but you're just like oh yeah this could just be anyone else producing a video in 2007 it could be i don't know who was popular probably Katy perry Katy perry or someone at that time someone lady gaga around that time it could have been any of her music videos it just has this mass-produced pop look but we kind of went down a rabbit hole with jolin sai and she seems like a really cool person this song was the pride anthem for the 2007 taiwanese pride parade and she seems to be a big lgbtq advocate now obviously we don't know anything about what's going on in terms of lgbtq rights in taiwan and this is again what we're reading on wikipedia but she sounds like an interesting person have we got anything else on hammersmith well i think it's probably time to escape hammersmith on any means other than the tune Right, we're we're our onward connection section here. So this is what I've decided to do with this. So Hammersmith, if you know the Hammersmith bus situation, there are two bus stations there. I mean, Paul read all the buses. There's a lot of buses that go through here. And there are two bus stations. One of them sits atop the little mall that's in the, that is attached to the other Hammersmith station, the District and Piccadilly one. And that's sort of the higher level one. There's a second station that you have to exit that's on the ground level that's sort of just to the east, I guess. Maybe it's kind of the northeast of that bus station. So there's the upper level and the lower level bus station. The lower level bus station is a bit smaller. Now, we named all the buses that go from both those stations because they are both attached to Hammersmith. But because we're going to have to go back to the station, I said, let's focus on the lower level bus station for our onward connection. Wow, I feel like I'm rambling a lot. I hate Hammersmith bus stations, by the way. Although there is a bit that I like about them. So when you enter the higher level Hammersmith bus station, the buses enter and exit driving on the right. And it's a big thing. And it says that on the ground. And when I first moved to London, there was an article in Time Out about how the only place in London that cars drove on the right was outside the Savoy, on the Savoy Road, because of the theatre and things there. But I had been to Hammersmith the day I read that article. And I said, no, this is not correct. And I wrote to Time Out and I got my name and my little thing in Time Out. This was when t- t- you still had to pay for Time Out. This is how long ago this was. And I have that cut out and I think I still have it in a box in my room. So that was my claim to fame in 2011 when I wrote that or 2012. That's the buses drive on the right on the way into yes. Hammersmith bus station. Just the higher mm-hmm. level ones on the way out. Just the right. higher level station. The bottom station is the lower level station. I feel like I've been rambling about this for ages i'm sorry i'm gonna get to our onward connection which is bus 533 again this is a single decker bus which is unusual for me but i like bus 533 now 533 it's unusual to have a bus in the 500s there aren't many of them in london and this is a temporary bus that gets put in when hammersmith bridge is closed and hammersmith bridge closed I think 2019 and the damage to Hammersmith Bridge from what I've heard is a lot more extensive than they knew and I think it's going to be closed for quite a while so the 533 might be in service for quite a while so unfortunately if you're listening to this 300 years in the future oh I don't know what's going to be happening with the 533 or even maybe five years in the future but I think the 533 you know when people can travel again which hopefully won't be too long is a fun bus to ride it goes it misses hammersmith bridge and it goes down towards barnes which is an interesting area of london it's so posh down there and it's not somewhere that's on the tube it's not somewhere where a lot of buses go and it's this really beautiful route the 533 takes along the river and through barnes by barnes bridge which is a lovely way to walk across you get down by the london wetland center uh, which is a great place to visit expensive but a great place to visit and then it does this sort of partial loop kind of like the loop that the central line would have done around by liverpool street if that had been approved and it does this sort of partial loop uh, by castle now and goes back up to Ham- 
Hammersmith. And I just think that's an area of London that unless you live around there or you know someone around there that not many people get to just sort of west of Putney. And it's an exciting place to visit. So my, the 533 is my bus recommendation. And there we go. An expert recommends the 533. I actually just took that one because it was just put into service in 2019. I took that sort of just before the pandemic on a day out. And then I ended up walking to Putney and then there was a football game at Craven Cottage. Let's not get into that drama. But yeah, the 533 would be my recommendation. And that brings us to the part that you've definitely been waiting for. Where the we best part. The next station. I just, this is all I talk about. I'm like, oh, what station's going to come next? What are we going to pick next? I would really like to maybe leave the West for a while. I like West London a lot, but I'd like to try to go somewhere yeah. different. Somewhere northeast. I do or feel south. like it looks like we're, because this is so. Yeah, there's probably barely any tube stations in South London, Paul. We know this. There's a few. Um, there's a few. I, there's. I feel like it, it because these three stations have been so had so much to them. I do feel like it looks like we're rigging it. So I kind of maybe want something a little less exciting. Yeah. So here we go. There's me shaking around the bag. Uh, I'm too nervous now. It's very nervous. Actually, wrecking. getting anxious. What are we going to get? Okay. <laughs> oh, what? If, what is it? What is it? It's Tottridge and Whetstone. Tottridge and Whetstone. Yes. Right. Um, Where is that? It's on the Bakerloo line, I'm pretty sure. Like the north end of the Bakerloo line. I think trains terminate there on the Bakerloo line, don't they? Is it the terminus of the Bakerloo line? No, that's up at Harrow. No, that's Harrow. Oh, I know. It's There's Harrow and something that sounds like Whetstone. Harrow and Wheelstone. Harrow and Wheelstone. Tottridge and Whetstone is on the northern line, I think. We don't know anything much about Tottridge and Whetstone. We'll find I think, out. I think no. I think it's on the what's the? It's on the high no the Edgware branch. I think it's like one of the second last ones on the Edgware branch. Could I could be wrong? We'll get back to you with that in our next episode of Round and Round We Go. Oh boy! All right. Okay. Tottridge and Whetstone. Let's do it. I'm excited. All right, we finished episode number three. That means we have a, our first challenge, which we'll get to just after the credits, but we've got our first challenge before we start the next episode. Uh, usual credits, we did everything. That's that's how it goes. Me, Emily Turner. Me, Paul Burkett Gray. Yeah, we did it all, except for our beautiful art by Colleen McIsaac. You can find their work at Little Foible Art on Instagram. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at roundalroundpod, or you can email us at roundalroundpod at gmail.com. Very easy. It's all roundalroundpod. And this is where we are going to give you your first challenge. So this is a challenge you can do at home. You do not need to travel on any trains to do this challenge. You can if you want to, but it's based on using the tube map and coming up with a plan for this. So we are right now at Hammersmith and City uh, Hammersmith Station, so the one on the Circle Line and the Hammersmith and City Line. Our next station is Tottridge and Whetstone. For this challenge, we want you to come up with a route, any route you like, that gets you between those two stations. But what do you have to do, Paul? You have to use every single line on the London Underground once and only once. Using bits of track where there's two tube lines sharing it, for example, bits of the district and circle lines counts as using both of them. Don't forget to use the Waterloo and City line. Yeah, don't forget it. It's it's, a, it's an essential part of the tube. So yes, and you don't have to go by what's actually open right now if something was closed or something like that. That's fine. But you want to use every line only once to get you between this station not the other Hammersmith station. It has to be the one on the Circle Line and the Hammersmith and City Line and Tottridge and Whetstone. You can tweet us with a map or a list of stations or how you did it uh, or message us on Instagram. We will, if people get back to us and they have answers that are fun, we will mention them on the next podcast. You don't need to travel the journey for real, but if you want to try doing that, you're more than welcome to. But we won't watch a three-hour video of you doing it, so don't please don't send us that. So, Paul, your list of sources. 
for episode three, Hammersmith, Hammersmith and City and Circle Line Station. The books we used were The Hammersmith and City Railway, 150 Years by Mike Horn, The Circle Line, An Illustrated History by Desmond F. Croom, London's Underground Stations, A Social and Architectural Study by Lawrence Manier, Underground Architecture by David Lawrence, Tube Station Trivia by Jeff Marshall, The London Underground, A Diagrammatic History by Douglas Rose, Labyrinth, A Journey Through London's Underground by Tamsin Dillon, Will Self, Mark Wallinger, Marina Warner, Christian Wilmar, and Louise Kreusch. Why Do Shepherds Need a Bush? London's Underground History of Tube Station Names by David Hilliam. What's in a Name? Origins of Station Names on the London Underground by Cyril M. Harris. And we also used the website Clive's London Underground Line Guides, uh, found at davros.org, created by Clive Feather. And we used Ordnance Survey Maps from 1866 and 1893, found on the website of the National Library of Scotland. Links to those websites and full details of all the books should be in the episode notes on the podcast webpage. So, thanks for joining us again, and join us next week where we will learn where exactly Totteridge and Whetstone is. (laughs) 